Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, short lecture on uh, data to distribution. So, so far we have been looking at uh, distributions. The distribution is given to you and you have to do some calculations, right? Joint density, finding the marginal, finding the continuous, etc. Okay? So, quite in, in practice when you look at uh, data, you are only going to have data, isn't it? So, it is going to be a lot of data, you will have a sense of histogram, summary, you know, mean, minimum, maximum, standard deviation, you will have a sense of what the data is. Maybe you also know that some part of the data I want to model in discrete way, some part of the data I want to model in continuous way. I showed you the iris data uh, as an example just to motivate how these things may look. So, what is the connection? How do we move between data and distribution? What are the things to watch out for? What are the things to be careful about? Uh, in the entire data science course, you will see a lot of emphasis on this. Uh, there are different ways in which people will emphasize how you have to be careful when you go from data to distribution. Uh, let me say a few words on this uh, as a conclusion for this week's lectures. Okay. So, we have been talking a lot about this iris data set. Uh, this is a very small data set by comparison today. It has only 150 uh, lines of data, but it, uh, it, it tells its own story in a very nice way, right? It has a vector, there is a class variable which is discrete, and then there is a sepal length, sepal width which you want to model as continuous, and petal length, petal width you want to model as continuous, and there is all sorts of dependency between these things, and one needs to be careful about how we are going to uh, model this, right? So, how do we model this uh, to statistically describe? Maybe you want to think of a joint distribution, uh, but uh, you know, so how, how do you write down these things? There is discrete, there is continuous, you, you have to have conditionals and you have to worry about a lot of these kind of things, right? So, how do we do this? Uh, we saw the summary things before, but now let me jump to uh, one interesting type of picture. You can do these 2D histograms and uh, you can combine them with the classes. Okay? So, what I have done here in the left picture is, I have done the 2D histogram of SL and SW. We saw this before, we saw this before for only class 0. Now, on the same plot, I have done for class 1 and class 2 and I have shown them in different colors. Okay? That is what I have done in the uh, plot on the left. The plot on the right, I have shown the sepal length and the petal length, okay? SL and PL and again for different classes, class 0, class 1, class 2. Okay? So, you see how the histograms are looking you know very interesting, they are very different uh, 2D histograms, uh, they, they, they give you a picture. Okay? So, maybe you want to think of them as continuous random variables. For every class you have a different pair of continuous random variables which are jointly distributed, maybe you can think of them as some sort of uh, distribution etcetera. Okay? But uh, interestingly, you see that this pair SL and PL seems to separate out the classes, right? The classes do not seem to overlap too much. There is a little bit of overlap, not too much. On SL, SW, you see a lot of overlap between the classes. Here, there is not uh, too much overlap, number one. Number two point I want to observe, want you to observe, this is very, very important is, how many points do you have in each bin of your 2D histogram? Look at the number there, look at the Y axis, the Z axis. It's gone to really low numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, quite often it's 0, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, maximum is 5, it doesn't go beyond 5. Okay? Why did that happen? It happened because you have only 50 pieces of data for 50 instances of data for each class. Okay? Once you start doing all these 2D histograms with multiple variables, it turns out you need a lot of bins. Okay? For SL, for instance, if I take uh, you know between 5 and 8, maybe even if I take 6 bins, Okay, for PL between 2 and 6, maybe again I take another 6 bins okay, or 5 bins let us say. Already you have 5 into 5, 25 bins in 2 dimension. Okay? 25 bins and there is only 50 instances of data. What is going to happen? The number of uh, data that can come into each bin is very, very, very less. Okay? So, this problem of multiplication of the bin numbers right, is, is a very big problem. And this is just 2 dimensions. Supposing you want to do a joint distribution for more than 2 random variables, right? Just like we did two random variables, you can do multiple random variables. We will see that in the subsequent lecture. But the number of bins is going to explode very quickly and you won't have data. You will have very little data. When your bins have very little data, you can't rely on them. That is not a very strong uh, uh, data that gives you a strong you know, comfort or confidence in making any sort of statement statistically about what is going on. Okay? So, this kind of thing is very important. Okay? So, you look at the data, you look at the summary, you look at the histograms, maybe you look at the joint histograms like this, 
but be mindful of how many how much data you have and make sure you have enough data to do your modeling in some reasonable fashion okay but here again you know so this tells you this tells you how to deal with one discrete and say two continuous random variables right how will you describe this so these are not difficult you know you just extend from what we did before when how did we describe one discrete and one continuous random variable we simply gave, gave the pmf for the discrete random variable and we did conditionals for every possible value of the discrete random variable same thing you can do here right supposing you have x y z where x is discrete and y z are continuous you know x has a range tx and it has a pmf px for every value that x takes you simply define a conditional joint density f y z given x equal to x okay so you can do this and so the overall joint density will simply become the average of this this is very similar to what we did before so this kind of modeling you can do i mean you can write it down very cleanly as a probabilistic model in this fashion if you want to okay okay so i want to just quickly point out a few uh, pieces of uh, wisdom about how to go from data to distribution there should be enough data points uh, this is a problem and i pointed out how even in the iris class uh, this is very difficult so in practice mostly unless you have very few data unless you have you know very specific uh, things mostly people will not try to find the distribution directly because finding the distribution uh, will require a lot of data and you may not have that much data maybe for one or two uh, random variables together you can find the distribution but when you have a lot of random variables it's difficult to find uh, distribution in practice so mostly uh, people work around it a little bit but you know as far as possible if you have a sense of the overall distribution of the data you're looking at overall variables that are of interest to you then i think you're on much more firmer ground because all the calculations are from probability they just come in very cleanly and you can think about them and do them very nicely if you have a sense of the distribution so that's that's something important to pick up as you look at data so let me also describe one more data set so this is this uh, diabetes data set i will show you in, a, in the collab notebook how to get this data set and how to access it i will do that uh, but notice here it's slightly becoming bigger okay it's bigger than the iris data set the iris data set was sort of smallish here you have 442 patients and there are 10 variables okay already you can see the number of variables are going up if you start doing you know joint histograms for all of these things with bins you're not going to go anywhere okay so you have to think of these problems in a very very different way not always start with distribution you should have a sense of the distribution but then you should think of a few variables at a time and see if you can connect them in some reasonable way etc okay so supposing you give this distribution I'll, I'll, i mean i don't want to talk too much about this data in this lecture we will i will give you the uh, the data itself and then you can look at it and try and answer this question of how would you describe these distributions okay so data is not going to be sufficient uh, so usual goal is not to find the distribution but only to find something like what is the disease progression one year after I have measured all these things. So they were also already diabetic in the beginning to start with. These are all the data points that I had in the, at that time. Now after one year what is going to be their situation? Can we come up with any sort of prediction? Okay. So, so, so you make some assumptions on the distribution to whatever extent possible you figure out what you can say about the distribution and then uh, as long as you can justify see if you can justify those assumptions from the data and then you can go ahead and do some computations okay so in this lecture we did not talk too much about these kind of aspects how to go from data to distribution something we did not really spend too much time on and as you progress in data science you will learn more about it but what's uh, important in this course in statistics 2 at least is the other skills part okay given a distribution how do you compute marginals how do you compute uh, you know conditionals how do you play around with it how do you make some statements about it those things uh, we have to pick up skills okay thank you very much